Sarah is a daughter, a wife, a mother, um, and a breast cancer survivor. She graduated from St. Louis University with a master of athletic training and is a certified health and wellness coach as well. Sarah works with transitioning women from active cancer treatment into survivorship. Sarah, I know when we first connected to you shared a little bit of your story with me and there were there were some similarities too in that we were both pregnant when we found out we had oh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I was at the beginning of my pregnancy you were towards the end at of the your end. pregnancy mm-hmm. um so I want to just ask you like can you can you take us all back to that day when you were told that you had cancer you know how far along were you what was your diagnosis and and what did that feel like yeah um so that day it was actually Valentine's Day. My husband and I never celebrated Valentine's Day, but now it has a whole new meaning. Um, I was 31 weeks pregnant. I thought it was my second baby. So I thought my the lump that I had felt, which was a very large lump, was just me getting ready for like breastfeeding. And um, I remember like kind of the, the quick chain of events that led me into the surgical oncologist's office where she basically was saying, you know, it doesn't look good. And we're thinking this could be breast cancer where I had my first mammogram and my first, um, my first biopsy, but it was, um, it was a little scary to hear, but a part of me, I, I have thought about this a, a couple of times is that I, for women who hear about their cancer early on in their pregnancy, at least in, in my situation, I knew that like, I, I had four weeks to go before I had a baby who could be born potentially healthy, which she was, and she is, and she's gorgeous, and she's three oh, now, and amazing. But, but I, you know, it is hard to hear when you're pregnant that you've got something going else going on inside your body other than growing the baby, because you've already got a lot going on in your mind mentally. But um, hearing that you have cancer when you're pregnant is, is difficult enough, um, and to have to make the decision that you have to make no matter where you are, if you're early in your pregnancy to have to do chemo while you're still pregnant or whether you have to decide to have a baby early. I mean, those decisions are, can be hugely traumatic and hard and, and very difficult. So that went out the window when I had to have a 35 week induction. So that was probably the hardest part was having to give up on some things that I knew, like I knew this was going to be my last pregnancy. And I knew, um, I knew I wanted these things like really strongly because I had a little bit of trauma for my first birth. And So I had to grieve a lot all at once. Like I had to grieve cutting my pregnancy short, the possibility I might have a NICU baby, then knowing that this was basically the starting line of a long treatment journey. And, and knowing that like the first year of my baby's life wasn't going to be about bonding and about breastfeeding and dealing or like, you know, trying to figure out a family of four instead of a family of three. It was going to be a lot about my personal journey. So it was, it was a lot to take like in the matter of a a day, a week, you know, that I had to process it. So everything happens so quickly and uh, you know, being pregnant and having cancer, you don't, you probably didn't even notice the tiredness or if any of those symptoms were affecting you. Cause 'cause yeah, (laughs) yes, exactly. What are some of the surprising things you learned through your journey? Um, throughout, let's see. It's funny because when I, when I look back at it, what seemed like, gosh, this is such a big deal. Um, when I look back at it now, it just doesn't feel like a big deal at all. Um, and maybe that's because of the intentional work I did, knowing that I was building my resiliency. Um, at the time, you know, I made it a big deal and it was this huge thing, which is now whenever I mentor other women, I'm like, oh, I've been there. Like I know how, how much of a big deal that feels, but when you look back on this decision or how this is affecting you, it's not, you're going to remember it as not a big deal. Like, gosh, I got through that and it was no big deal. Um, I think that was kind of surprising. I remember feeling like I need, I like to educate myself on everything that's going on. And I remember immersing myself in Facebook groups and I would Google my chemo drugs and the effects and long-term effects and short-term effects and, and being really hung up on the fact there's like 
a few studies and a few situations out there where the people who had the same chemo drug that I did never got their hair back, which my losing my hair was a really traumatic part for me. And now when I think back on not having my hair that whole summer, I didn't have my hair. I learned a lot about myself. I learned, um, it's kind of nice to not have hair in the summer when it's you're in the Midwest and it's hot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it, yes, and it takes it took like no time to get ready. Um, there were traumatic parts, but I think when I look back, I think about the good stuff over the bad stuff, and I think that's surprising because I think a lot of times when I was going through it, I'm I'm going, this is the worst thing that's ever going to happen to me. Yeah. <laughs> no, it really it wasn't. <laughs> In the moment, it was. In the moment, it was the worst thing happening to me. But absolutely, yeah. you know, everybody deals with whatever's happening to them very differently, right? Like you, something that's really incredible, and I think you know that's important for for viewers to to see and hear and know and and think about how they can do it themselves. Is you really took this the struggle, right? Like this really hard thing in your life you know, you're pregnant with cancer and making all these decisions and going through all this stuff, like you just said, and you turned it into such a positive thing. You became a health coach. You Mm -hmm. work with a nonprofit, um, who really supports women's women's, um, mental health. Mm -hmm. I would love for you just to tell us a little bit more about these two avenues that, that you found that were so positive and, and how did these decisions happen? How, where did they start and where are you right now with these two, um, these two organizations? Yeah. So when I, I think even before I had cancer, it, it was on my goals for a long time to become a health coach. So I have a background in athletic training. So I have a master's and I worked with pre and post um, rehab patients or anybody who was trying to be mobile for a long time without um, injury. That was kind of my niche and what I, I really enjoy doing. Um, and then I knew I, I wanted to coach people. I wanted to talk with them just and share my life experiences. Cause I'm kind of one of those people that I'm like, Oh, there's a new diet. I'm going to try it so that I can speak personally to it. Or there's a new, you know, a new thing to learn over here. I'll go learn it so that I can speak to it and help people. But it was, it was like going through my cancer journey that I was like, okay, I, I need to make this big shift and I want to help other people. And it was when I read um, this book called The Upside of Stress. And she really talks about how sometimes the best way to like process and manage your own stress and to feel good is to help others. Mm-hmm. And I 100% agree with that. Like, I don't think that there's anything that gives me more of a high than when I walk away from somebody and I could have like, even in the slightest way, planted some seed that even years from now, they'll be like, because of this one little thing you said to me. And that I I know that I taught a goal setting workshop some somewhere along the line. And then years later, I met this couple and they're like, we sold our house because we decided we wanted to travel. And it all came from your goal coaching. And I was like, holy crap, you, this is huge. So it was, it was going through cancer that made me go, okay, now is the time I had for years. I want to be a goal or I want to be a um, health coach. I need to just go do it. So literally I got my coaching training in a February and then the pandemic really hit in March. So I got that in and was really taking any client who was interested in coaching. And then I was coaching a, a good friend who was like, our friendship was kind of growing mm-hmm. through my training. And, um, she was like, you know, you would be really good at coaching like breast cancer specific. And I'm like, oh, I, I'm not ready to just say that that's who I coach because, you know, there's a, a whole population of people that need help. There's the diabetics and the, and the heart disease and everybody, I want to help everybody. And, and really what it came down to was like, that was really where I was called to help. I have personal experience with them and I can relate with them and yeah. I can speak from experience. And so then I started my own little coaching business and then my friend um, who talked me into coaching and niching down, um, we started a podcast together, mostly just for fun. Um, but then it started to be really successful. We got sponsored by hospitals. We were getting on and we were talking about the reels, the thing that like, you know, all the symptoms and the things that we go through that is behind that beautiful pink ribbon or the runs and the people, the things that people see that is breast cancer. 
we were talking about how it affects relationships and how moving into survivorship is probably the hardest part about it. And we were talking about losing your identity when you lose your hair. I mean, just so many things, making relationships with your doctors and why that's important. So we were talking about all of this when a couple of months ago, she came to me and she said, you know, why don't we like, why don't you marry the nonprofit and your coaching together? And then we can just do this like huge force. So now we um, mentor newly diagnosed women. So when you're newly diagnosed, you can get on faiththroughfire.org, find a mentor. We match, we have about um, almost 30 mentors and we match you up with somebody who um, has been similar in age and similar in diagnosis. And um, they, it's all done through text. So I mentor somebody in New York, I mentor somebody in New Mexico, and then a, a bunch around here. So then we create relationships over text message and I'm there if, or any of our mentors are there, if somebody's having a spin out day, like, oh my gosh, this just got put on my plate and my marriage is falling apart. And, and we're not there to counsel. We're there to just be a listening ear, which is sometimes all you need when you just need somebody who understands. Survivorship, right? Like that's mm-hmm. the most difficult part. I know it wasn't until I got to that part. I didn't even realize that, you know, it, you're focused on like, okay, let's just get through this treatment. This is the hard mm-hmm. part. It's going to be the hard part. And then towards the end, I was, I was talking to another survivor and she's, she's like, yeah, like it took me a year plus after to figure out what, how, how to readapt to life. Like yeah, life is different after cancer. Life is different after going through so much and, and being faced yeah. with such a heavy diagnosis. Um, right. You know, I know this is really important to you too, in terms of quality of life in survivorship. Um, Can you share what some of the struggles were that when, when you would actually hit that phase and we're like, this is, this is, this would be hard. (laughs) Yeah. And I have, I have, so we have a whole podcast that's dedicated to, to my, so exactly my struggle. I'll give you kind of the big highlights, but when I was, um, about four months out from treatment, um, I just started noticing things. I started noticing I was like not sleeping at night. I would go to bed like normal. And then I would wake up about one o'clock in the morning and I would just lay there and my mind would literally be running a marathon of thoughts. And the thoughts were anywhere from financial troubles, to what if my cancer comes back, to wh- how are my kids going to raise themselves by them, but not by themselves, but how are my kids going to grow up without a mom? Um, you know, there were suicidal thoughts that creeped in there every now and then. Um, obviously nothing I never acted upon, mm-hmm. um, but you know, they're there and they, and it was something I had never experienced before. I remember driving to my kids to swimming lessons. So I had, I had like basically a, a one-year-old and and then I had um I had a four-year-old four and a half year old at the time we were driving to swimming lessons one day and I had a panic attack in the car and I had never had one of those before um and I, I didn't even know what to name it I'm like why can't I catch my breath like I can't even inhale and my mind is racing and you know you've got kids in the back it's not like kids are quiet like they're not they're supporting you through your panic attack um so I had that. I I couldn't lose weight. I was having this weird out of body experience where it felt like I was watching my life happen, but I wasn't actually living within my skin and my body. So many things. And, you know, and even now, as I talk about, I'm sure I'm missing something that was happening at the time. But, um, but I worked as a medical assistant at the time at at an out of hospital birth center, which thus my really desire to have an out of hospital birth. But I had done a lab, a couple labs, I was reading a book and I had done a couple labs on my thyroid. And so my thyroid antibodies came back elevated. And if you Google that, like, you know, like I was doing with everything, um, it, of course, the first thing it says is thyroid cancer, but you know, a lot of the other, every, I checked off every single symptom and it would, that was just, of course, that was a big red light for me. And it was a big trigger. And I was like, oh my gosh, my, my cancer is coming back. But I was like, this just, I mean, this, it kind of makes sense. Like I, at least I have something to name what's going on with my problems. So this took me down the functional medicine route. So I started looking into functional medicine where I didn't, I was like, oh, okay, I need to go find an endocrinologist. 
And I was like, well, if I find an endocrinologist, they're going to tell me my thyroid is not functioning well. So they'll put me on a medication and it'll make my thyroid better. But why is my thyroid not functioning well? I'm like, well, maybe it's because I had toxic, you know, chemicals put in my body with the chemo, which was the whole point of it. But so it just, it took me down a, a long rabbit hole. But what I, what I really enjoyed about it is that I dug my way out. Like I figured it out, not all by myself. I had my team supporting me. I had my husband cheering me on, like saying, yes, go spend money on functional medicine because your insurance doesn't cover it. Go like, let's change up our diet. You know, I, I ended up eliminating, um, sugar and dairy for a while. And I did this whole elimination diet. It took about 21 days. Um, but at the end of my elimination diet, every single one of my symptoms went away. Like yeah. there's some, there's something to this. There's something to say, like what's around me is affecting me. Mm -hmm. And I ended up cleaning up my chemicals in our house. Like we started using like vinegar for cleaner. I cleaned up my shampoos, my makeup. I did it all a little bit at a time because if anybody who's ever gone down that right route knows, um, it can get very costly. Right. So a little bit at a time, I cleaned up our products. I cleaned up our kitchen. Um, so really, I found myself three months out from doing some work on myself and on our house and what I'm putting in and on my body. And everything was gone. Wow. Like wow. the insomnia was gone. My depressive thoughts were gone. Now they would creep in every now and then. Um, but it was usually when I would fall off of whatever I was doing with my eating habits. Um, mm -hmm. But what was so great about it and what made it feel like it was like a really resilient time of my life is that every time a symptom would creep in, like if I would have a sleepless night, I would be like, okay, you know, I wonder what, what's up with that. Like I could just blame the whole situation. Like, well, you've been through a lot or you know, you're dealing with something, but I would be like, okay, what did I eat? Like, what was my, I was more stressed that day. Okay. So maybe more stress, like really um, plays into my insomnia. I need to like calm down and have self-care habits throughout the day. Oh, or maybe, you know, one of, one of my other weird symptoms is if I, if I drink a little, um, which I don't drink a ton now, um, because I eliminated a lot of it. Uh, if I drink anything that's like unclean, like I usually try to go for organic wines, but I have stinky armpits. So <laughs> What I, what I think is really cool and what I try to do with any of my clients is like, let's just notice things about yourself. Notice things that empower you to be your greatest health advocate. Everyone is going to be different. What affects me is going to affect you differently. So what I have learned from all of my cancer journey is that you take something that was hard and if you dig yourself out from it, like you are going to be more empowered But for you, what mm -hmm. beautiful struggle mean to you? Uh, it means, it means not, not just taking it as the struggle. It means growing from the struggle. It's taking your pain and making it your purpose and moving forward with it. Maybe that means helping others. And maybe that means being a better you.